I have now the great, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Alice Rathorn. She is the design critic of the International Herald Tribune, the global edition of the New York Times, and her weekly design column, published every Monday, is incredibly important. Tarkovsky once said that in our times, uh, we don't have enough rituals. We need to reintroduce rituals, and I've always had one ritual, which is to buy a book every day, but uh, in the last couple of years, more and more, my main ritual is to read this column every Monday. Uh, Alice is also a very uh, influential design commentator, speaker of many conferences, the World Economic Forum in Davos. She's a trustee of the Arts Council England and also the Whitechapel Gallery. Alice has been an advisor to the Met Marathon in 2010 and has brought in extraordinary positions in design mapping and has been advising us also for this year's marathon about the garden. In this following session, Alice will present a panel and introduce a panel um, with Adrian Goes of West 8, Something and Sun, and Field Club. A very warm welcome to Alice Rathorn. is a hard act to follow, particularly on this dark day for Wales after last night's rugby result. Um, so a moment of sympathy for the Welsh nation. Um, I'm delighted to be here to introduce this design session. Obviously, the theme of this year's Serpentine Marathon is the garden, the beautiful garden that Piet Udolf designed for Peter Zumthor's pavilion. And so we thought it would be interesting to look at garden design in very different contexts and with very different intentions. So we're going to look at garden design in an urban context, a post-industrial context, and in an out-in-the-wilds context through the work of our speakers. And the first I'm going to introduce to you are Andy Merritt and Paul Smythe of Something and Son. Something and Son are an eco-social design group based here in London, up in Dalston. Um, Andy is a graphic designer turned artist, and Paul is a design engineer turned activist. They work with Sam Henderson, who's a social scientist turned farmer, and they develop projects that experiment with different forms of food growing technology, sustainability, and community engagement. Their current projects include Farm Shop, on Dalston Lane, which is the conversion of a derelict shop turned women's refuge. It's four floors, very small, into an experimental laboratory in which they're experimenting to see how many different types of food and what volume of them they can grow in such a small space. They've also developed an aeroponic garden for the Gwangju Design Biennial in South Korea. So I'd like to welcome Andy and Paul from Something and Sun. I think so, yeah. Okay, while we're waiting for the visuals to come up, which hopefully will any second, I'll just start by, um, can you tell us how you founded something and some? Because I think you'd all sort of got to know each other as friends initially. So yeah. why did you start working together and what was the thinking behind it? We all had interest in uh, working with other people. We, we, we're interested in our own subject, but we also want to sort of see the boundaries of our own subject as well. So we were 
So we were all sort of actively looking to work with different people and we didn't know each other beforehand and then we came together for something like that. Yeah. And so one of the sort of central themes that runs through your work, because as you're going to tell us when the computer eventually works, when you've worked in just a few years on a really wide range of projects all around vegetation of one sort or another, but there are lots of different themes that are encompassed. So what are the key ones? I think we're really interested in um, bringing people together as well, kind of the design of communities. And as you'll see in Farm Shop, um, one of the things we've done there is we've actually kind of created um, a group of people with kind of shared in expertise and enthusiasms um, around a physical space. Um, and lots of it comes from our kind of past, past lives, I suppose, in different types of work. So myself as um, an engineer, having worked in developing countries, um, and obviously Andy having sort of worked as an artist and a graphic designer. And, these kind of um, enthusiasms we've, we've kind of brought together and then always try and start very, very simply uh, with our ideas and, and just share ideas but amongst each other in fairly open conversation. And then these sort of tend to lead to the type of projects you'll see um, us going through the next sort of 15 minutes. So given that the garden is the theme of today's marathon, how does that relate to your work? I mean, in a sense, Farm Shop is one great big garden, but a very productive one. Yeah, there's, um, there's sort of different elements that you'll see. We've kind of done a project around com compost, for example. Uh, swifts, which are sort of uh, the bird of summer. And uh, what else? The uh, mushrooms. And there's sort of different elements to um, what a garden is. Maybe it sort of pushes the boundary what a garden is sometimes, but uh, there's, there's some sort of link to it. But also it's kind of our ideas, we feel, kind of sort of come out of a garden shed is that those kind of experimental sort of quintessentially English we've been quoted as uh, um, and yeah so it's sort of they're all kind of linked to that sort of garden shed idea. I think, yeah. One of the really lovely things about farm shop is you know you do effectively have a garden shed and it's very sort of folksy and English and recognisable in many ways but also you've played with a lot of quite advanced technology mm -hmm. I think you've got aquaponic, hydroponic, aeroponic technology could you tell us a little bit about how you've developed those systems to grow food? I think that um, one thing is that the garden landscape for us is changing. So like technology is playing a much more important role in both what the countryside looks like and eventually what gardening looks like. So we just come back from a career and in there lots of people are growing their own gardens within their apartment blocks, for example. Um, and I think that with um, greater advances in technology, um, kind of the introduction of um, sort of chemistry and biology, sort of the pop, pop, as that becomes more popular, that's coming into sort of traditional garden design. Um, and also, like, everyone's seen these kind of visuals of hydroponics and aquaponic gardens. Um, people are trying to reinvent new ways of growing food and plants, and we've certainly been inspired by those, kind of seeing those technologies come to the fore. But it's not, it's not all new. I mean, we own a book called Indoor Gardening from the 1970s, and so it's not like this, this stuff is, um, is new stuff. It's just we're reinterpreting it in a different environment. Yeah, yeah. So aquaponics is um, a combination of fish farming, um, which essentially you catch the waste water from those fish farms, which is very, very high in ammonia. Um, you put it through um, a filter, which is rich in um, nitrifying bacteria, which then converts the ammonia into nitrates. And the nitrates themselves can then be used to feed plants. Um, and in our case, vegetative vegetables. So we're growing um, salads and lettuce and herbs, um, basically from the wastewater from fish. Potentially, this is quite a transformative, transformational kind of technology because um, it means instead of hydroponics, which uses fossil fuel-derived nutrients to grow food, you can actually extract the nutrients from fish, which are also a protein source. And it's one of these technologies, as, as many of the things we get excited about, have kind of emerged from um, a, a kind of design context in which you're dealing with very little. So developing countries where you might be trying to look at the self-sufficiency of a community. Um, and actually, in those instances, the ability to grow a protein source in terms of tilapia, a fish in our case, and also vegetables together um, in a kind of closed cycle is potentially very exciting. Um, and it also starts to deal with one of the key environmental challenges is increasingly as we move away from food being um, sort of plucked out of the ocean, for example, fish, and we start increasingly farming fish, what do we do with all those nutrients and that wastewater? And one of those things you can do is you can then essentially filter all of the bad stuff out and use it to grow food. And it's just one of those examples of a technology where we've kind of learnt about it, engaged with experts, and then got sort of slightly geeky and, 
excited about it and reinterpreted it into something which um, people can engage with. And it is fantastic when you go to farm shop because the first thing you see when you grow in, I mean, there are, is literally something growing, whether it's animal, vegetable, fish, mineral, whatever, in sort of every square inch of the building. And the first room you go in, there are the fish tanks with the tilapia. And then on the walls, there are other tanks with lettuce, squash, I think. You grew there, basil and other herbs. And those, all the stuff that's grown there is used in a little cafe. So you can actually stay there and eat it. It's quite amazing. But Guangzhou is quite different, isn't it? Because there you created a, I think you call it a hanging garden, and that's yeah. using aeroponics, so can you tell us about that? Uh, so aeroponics is kind of a bit more basic than aquaponics um, because you uh, haven't got the fish in there so the fish aren't providing nutrients so you have to put the nutrients in through um, artificial means, i.e. big bottles of nutrient. Um, and the idea with aeroponics is that you basically, the, the roots hang in mid-air and you uh, feed the nutrients through a spray system. So we sort of, uh, normally it's kind of about this big um, but uh, we decided to do a, a larger kind of architectural installation where you could walk into it so you were amongst all the roots so they're above your head um, and it was a bit more of an experience and it was sort of showing the, sort of, uh, the two sides of life i.e. the dark and the light um, so, and the damp versus the um, sunshine. Great. Mm. And can I just check how are we going technically? Are we going to get the images <laughs> up? No. Say so it's a no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we will carry on. So, um, so what was the aim of Guangzhou? Was it to experiment with this technology? Because Guangzhou yeah. is a very special design biennial, which is really sort of testing new concepts of design. But I think you are the main garden element in the big exhibitions <laughs> yeah. curated. Yeah. Was, uh, I can't remember what the question was. Well, the question is, what was your aim at, at Guangzhou? For you, was it a technological experiment? Uh, yeah, the, and, but also to sort of bring this technology into an art context, um, make it more of an experience, because the, like the farm shop, we could have turned it into, a, we could have closed it off to the public and just grown food and then shipped it out to people, but we decided to open our doors and let people in, and it's the same thing with the Guangzhou project. We, wanted to allow people to see this technology and under, understand plants in a different way because normally you never see these roots at all. It's like sometimes, on, I'll show you in a minute, but like some, on some plants it's kind of four times the uh, plant on the above ground, so that, i.e. the roots are four times bigger than the plant and it's something you never actually see but it's an important part of life. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to show that and um, yeah. And can you talk about the community? side of your work because I know that's very important to all the projects. Yeah, I mean certainly I think that we um, we enjoy working with people naturally and when we started doing um, started doing farm shop the kind of first um, act I suppose was to put out this kind of call out to people to get involved um, and what you find is I think if you're very open in terms of how you um, how you get your ideas out there and let people share in their development then you can start to again build these communities and we found that um, in the case of farm shop we had kind of aquaponic farmers who live just around the corner. Um, a guy, kind of a taxi driver, pulling up over on the road opposite, coming in and looking at our fish tank and saying, you're only farming 80 fish, I farm 200 in my garden. And it kind of, I think if you're, if you're open and you engage and you create public spaces in which people can start their own discussions, then you'll realise that what seems like a very niche specialist kind of subject of urban agriculture or something futuristic, actually lots of people are already thinking about it and practising it, and only through creating those spaces um, those social spaces for people to engage with, you get that. Um, we had similar experience in Guangzhou because with that piece of work, I suppose we were helping the people, the kind of um, community we worked with there who were growing the plants for us in advance, helping them to understand some of the technologies going on in their own country. So in Korea, we got to visit kind of amazing high-tech farms with, with, which were kind of LED, light, LED lit, these kind of purple, um, purpley, purple lit spaces with um, high-tech shadowy plants growing in them. And... Um, that was nothing that anyone we'd said who didn't come to the installation had seen before. And actually, it turns out Korea is a leading kind of um, technology provider in terms of growing food. Um, and so it, you start to, to kind of join the dots together just by doing something in a very, very public way um, and getting something out there which is visual and exciting to start with. And given that it looks as though we're not <laughs> going to get the images... But we do actually have news. Oh, we, we are very um, apologetic for this situation because there seems to be a problem 
uh, with the projector. So anyway, with marathons, coffee breaks is when always the most urgent things happen. So we call for a five minute coffee break and then we gather again in five minutes. Many apologies and hope to see you in five minutes. <laughs>
and we listed kind of five or six things. We wanted to keep pigs, we wanted to grow mushrooms, we wanted to um, look, like raise fish, the first time in London for a very long time, um, keep chickens on the roof, that kind of thing. And then we were given a building and had to interpret those ideas into um, the, the best approximation of a farm and a shop. The second thing we kind of realised quite quickly um, was that we were getting very interested in how do you redesign a supply chain around this opportunity. So you've got um, the ability to actually not grow, only grow the food, but serve the food. Um, and so we've set up a cafe there and we run a lot of events. And, it, and what we've managed to do essentially is create a situation where we can grow food um, only sort of about five metres away from where it's cut, fresh lettuces are cut for people's sandwiches and to be served directly to people. And that's got us thinking around like what have we actually changed by doing that? And what we've changed, we've got rid of all um, packaging, um, we've got rid of all refrigeration, um, and we've actually been able to create a kind of um, very inspiring space where you go in and learn about food just because it's around you. And there's a certain transparency to the what we're doing in the, in the shop, um, which all of this tried to kind of to rep replicate. So I'd say that actually is our, that we've become more distant from our food production. Um, marketing and labeling, including organic labels and things, have filled the void. And they've kind of tried to conjure up these kind of old memories and images of what food is like. But when, in, when you come to farm shop, literally, if you don't like the way the fish are kept or the chickens are raised, you don't eat the food, but it's all very open, honest, and transparent. So this is the building we took over. We have studio space on the top floor. Um, we have a garden with a potty tunnel, um, aquaponics and hydroponics, which we spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, but one of the very first things we realized, because none of us had any experience growing food before, we're not farmers, um, was we'd have to have the space to learn and that farming is something that has to be durable and has to last. So the space has actually been designed to run as much as a business. So it can self-sustain and we're very proud to have taken on a, a full-time rent, moving from pop-up to business. Um, which enables us to continue this experiment and hopefully sort of inspire and replicate. So this is the um, front room of the shop. Um, it's again a poor picture, but the two tanks at the back there each house um, 40 tilapia, or 80 tilapia, um, which we're raising and eating in the shop. Um, and off to the right-hand side, um, you'll see the plants which are growing, fed from the wastewater from that shop um, and the cafe there. And what we, we're right on the, the um, shop, the high street as well. So there's a lot of kind of very interesting interaction with people as they walk by, and naturally people are kind of drawn to this strange kind of green living space. This is a um, system we designed upstairs, which is a hydroponic basil wall, um, where the water is pumped to the top and runs down like a river, and the plants actually live with their ro roots just resting within the kind of oxy um, oxygenated water, um, and that means they can grow very quickly. The systems are very, very shallow as well, so it's perhaps the kind of thing that's starting to inspire people to think, I could do this at home. The polytunnel outside um, both functions um, to grow food in the old way, um, which we're growing with more technological approaches, but also acts as a public space. We put on talks here, um, we run events. You can see in the front room, um, we have a capacity of around 150 people. So again, we just run as a kind of nightclub sometimes and bring people in. And the interesting thing there is that when they leave, inevitably, they're kind of talking and excited about food, um, as well as being quite pissed often. So it's kind of a, um, a, ni a nice kind of juxtaposition of kind of urban stuff and, and country stuff. These are the chickens um, overlooking the billboard opposite. We're lucky enough to get um, four eggs a day at the chickens. They're amazingly easy to look after. You just feed them and they kind of give you eggs. It's a very nice sort of open transaction. Um, and these eggs are sold in the cafe downstairs. We're now looking at um, partnering with a local um, mental health organization for them in the, in the gardens of their residents for them to grow more eggs for us, which we'll sell in the, in the cafe. Again, trying to kind of change the supply chain and change the way we get food, which is currently um, pretty poor. Um, uh, so this was an early project that we wanted to do, which was uh, we wanted to piece together mushrooms and Rubik's cubes. Um, um, it was a project we did on a roof in uh, Shoreditch. So it was like you had the city behind. Um, and it was one of the first kind of projects we did where we were looking into growing food that people could actually just come and pick mushrooms off. So we made a large Rubik's cube. It was two meters in um, cube. And um, we had an oak facade. And then within it, it was, uh, we had sawdust that was infused with mushroom spores. So we had five different edible mushrooms in. Oyster mushrooms um, did the best. And um, so coming out of the cube, you'd have, you'd have the uh, mushrooms uh, growing off the actual wood wooden structure and then over the years the idea is that in about 50 years time hopefully there's nothing left of the sculpture because the mushrooms have eaten it so they'll just be pulp. Um, this is uh, 
the oyster mushrooms coming off at the bottom of the structure, and they were sort of growing about so big. Um, and yeah, people could just come up and pick them off and uh, take them home and eat. Following our kind of um, both experiments, kind of composting um, in farm shop, but also I guess it's important to say now that we we've been quite um, we do quite a, a lot of sort of simple research, like things like looking on YouTube and saying, "Wow, what's going on there?" Or, or trying to look at kind of the ways that people are responding to some of these challenges around um, resilience and around kind of um, particularly in developing countries. How do you how do you live very very simply, or how do you use technology in a very very simple way? Um, and one of the things we came across was the concept of using um, compost actually to have showers. So people would produce use big compost piles to create hot showers. Um, so that got us quite interested in the idea of using compost as a heat producer. Um, and what we did, <coughs> again, was, was started researching this and understanding how it can work. And what we found is that um, if you get a big compost heap, um, you'll often have seen a steaming compost heap, anyone? Yeah. Well, basically, um, we started thinking about how can we take that, which usually has to work on a very, very large scale, um, and condense it into something that could be, could be used in a different way. Um, we, so we actually we took the concept of running water coils through a compost heap to extract the heat, um, which actually comes out as a result of um, sort of thermophilic bacteria, um, which is a, a, ro a reaction um, of the bacteria eating away um, at the food and compost waste with the right mixture of car carbon and nitrogen material. And you have to get that mixed very, very carefully. You have to get the right surface area of the stuff you're putting in. Um, you can then get lots of heat out. And then if you run water around that, you can extract the heat. And so we um, came up with the idea of a rotting compost um, kind of burger van, I suppose, um, which was you would be making your tea and then you put your tea bags um, into the compost heap and then that produces more heat, which you then use to make the tea. It's kind of a nice little cycle. Um, and we were um, able to do this um, at the V&A Museum. And so if you look at the, uh, the big box there, um, that's actually a compost heap, but it's been super insulated. So we ran insulation around it and made it very, very airtight so that we could replicate the heat you'd get from a very, very large heap on a much, much smaller scale. We then ran copper pipes through that um, and had a header tank at the top, a bit like you know, your toilet, you know, um, which runs down, goes through the compost bin, strips it of the heat it's producing just through vegetable waste, and then goes in 18 degrees and was coming out at about 55 at the bottom. And then we're using that 55 degree water to just top up with a little bit of extra heat to make tea and then putting the tea bags back in the compost bin. Um, and it's actually remarkably, having like, never done it before, and it actually worked, which was amazing. We, we left it at the V&A and actually opened up the top of the compost bin, and this big billow of, kind of steam came out. And then you, we put our hands in, and I'm sort of screaming my head off, going, Andy, Andy, it's hot, it's hot. And then um, it, it actually worked, simply by putting vegetables and um, toilet rolls, chopped up toilet rolls together, we could produce lots and lots of heat. Um, and just to kind of make it a bit more fun, um, we actually served that tea in, in test tubes and tried to kind of get people interacting with the whole science of it. Um, they put up their ideas for free energy on the side of the van. Um, and again, it's for us, we think it's really important that you don't just, you don't get too boring about these things. You know, you've got, to, you've got them to bring, bring them to life for people um, because science can be a really exclusive thing. And I think if you um, can make it easy and fun, then people interact with it more. And we were lucky enough to have lots and lots of uh, punters coming there, but unfortunately we were giving the tea away for free. Um, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. Uh, okay, so this is our final project that we'll talk about. Um, so this was the uh, project we did in Guangzhou, which was based around aeroponics and showing off the roots of plants and showing the dark and the light side of life. Um, this is just the, the diagram on the left, particularly sort of shows how much root system a plant a plant grows. Um, it's at least half the height of a plant. Um, so we kind, of, kind of wanted to replicate the experience of going in a cave, and because sometimes when you go in a cave, you can have the roots coming, growing down through the rock formations and going above your head, and this is a, just about an illustration of it. And, um, and also the, the thought of the dripping water within this dark cabin. So, um, so the idea was this is, a, this is a picture from the front, so you'd go through on the left-hand side into the dark room, um, and you'd be confronted by all these uh, hanging roots that are get, get, getting sprayed the nutrients through the aeroponic system. And then, um, then the water drips down into a big dark pool below it, which then has the pump in and pumps the water back up into the system. So there's just this constant wet spray going on and it's dark. And there's just these odd shafts of light that are coming out wherever the plants are. 
Um, this is a picture of the aeroponic system before the plants went in. So you can see the uh, light holes where the plants will eventually go into the system. And that's the uh, spray system going on, which you just about see. Um, and yeah, so the roots are growing out down through this net pot, and then they'll eventually be hitting right down to onto the aeroponic system. Uh, this is a picture from above. So we have these uh, eight rows of different plants growing along. So people then would, the guy on the left is coming out. There's a guy on the left um, <laughs> coming out from the dark room and they go upstairs and then onto a mezzanine. So then they can look across this uh, growing garden. And that is a picture of people in the garden. And that's just looking across it. And that is us. Lovely. Well, a big thank you to Paul and Andy um, for being so fantastic during the uh, technical hoo-ha earlier and thank you to all of you for being patient. I'm going to ask you one last question and this is one of Hans Ulrich's famous and probably most legendary questions which is, um, is there an unrealised project that you dream of realising? Yes. Go on, and what is it? Bloody hell. Uh, no. Multi-storey car parks, yeah, old, old people's homes. Yeah, we'd, I think there's quite a few. I mean, one of them is we'd like, we'd like to take the limits of our experimentation in Farm Shop to its sort of logical conclusion, which is doing something on a bigger scale. And so taking over a very large space in London and actually, actually making a dent in people's shopping baskets so you can get food in a different way, which is more based around people and then more sustainable. Um, we love multi-storey car parks and um, the idea of like uh, trying to bring manufacturing back into the city as well we're sort of looking into ideas around that so and that's kind of linked to farm shop in the way that it's about sort of making processes apparent to people so you're not you're not going into a supermarket and getting your packaged piece of food and then going home that you can actually see the whole workings of how things are made because it's all that all those processes are normally outside of the city and you don't get to see that kind of life and you have been looking for sites and, and talking to local councils about this, I think, haven't you? To we do have. The big, how's that progressing? It's, I mean, it's going really well. We've had, we've had a huge amount of interest in, in Farm Shop, and therefore that's opened the door for other sites. We're, we've been in talks about very, very, very large sites, um, which we'd obviously have to um, yeah, realise with finance and with partners and those sort of things. Because I think it's important that, as well as continuing our innovation, when you come up with something you think can change things, to actually explore that to its, to its limit and have a lot of fun in the kind of business design and the, the other elements of design, which, which aren't a physical manifestation, but actually about designing a new system. Um, but we also we have flippant projects. I know we'd quite like to maybe do a flywire or a bungee in Croydon, because it needs something sort of positive going on there. And we've got very, uh, lots, lots of things. So we're, we sort of um, are just... It's not just food. Yeah. <laughs> We're just learning to work with each other and sort of come up with new ideas and stuff Great. like that. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Thank, thank you. you.